everyone to our annual welcome everyone welcome to our annual reference seminar for 2021 normally we're on site at reference at Metcalf, but last year and this year we've changed up and we've gone online we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which we each of which each of us are on and where our library stands we pay respect to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to the other First Nations people. We celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal cultures and languages across Australia. As well, we acknowledge the contribution that many of many, that people of many nations have made to this country. We have a great range of speakers today for us to listen to, who will be covering a range of topics this morning. I'd ask you all to sit back with your kappa and enjoy, and please get involved in the discussions at the end. I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Jane Orble smith from the Librarian Reserve Corps. Jane works at Redcliffe and Kabucha Hospitals Libraries. The Librarian Reserve Corps was established in March 2020 in response to the growing COVID-19 epidemic and an identified need to capture quality health information. Today, she'll be presenting an overview of LRC, the Librarian Reserve Corps, and how it works with GOAN, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, Jane, and WHO to provide swift emergency response. Jane, I'd like to hand over to you. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. And I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you. This is quite a thrill to be included. What I'm going to talk a bit today, just to give you some sort of outline on what's going on, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the Librarian Reserve Corps, what we do, uh, my involvement, hoping somebody else might be interested, and how you can actually be involved and, and make a difference yourself. And I've provided some references in future reading, and I understand this will be up on your um, wiki, so everyone will have access to it. Uh, this is just a statement from Susan Norris, who is a leading scientist with the WHO. And I guess to give you some sort of idea of, of the background of how things came about and why it was so important, by the 1st of July last year, there were an average of 535 papers being produced every day relating to COVID. And you can imagine this is an absolutely massive amount of information. And the Librarian Corps was basically created to assist the WHO, the World Health Organization, and Goran in uh, making sense of this, these papers, identifying what's important and as important, what isn't of value. The um, Library of Reserve Corps continues today and is adapting to the requirements of the World Health Organization and offering additional services to simply indexing. So I'll give you a bit more of a talk about it. That was just to give you a sense of how important the component of librarianship has been to this COVID epidemic. The Librarian Reserve Corps is, consists of now 100 people. It was established in March 2020 when Dr. Lena Moses contacted one of the leading librarians, health librarians in the US, Elaine Hicks, at the Tulane University. And she was, the Goran required um, some way of making sense. They could see that straight away, even as, as early as March last year, that information was going to be an issue and a problem. But as importantly, to get that really, capture that really vital and important information. So Elaine recognised that there was a need for a coordinated effort. And she put a call out to the Medical Library Association, which is the lead health librarians group within the US, but also has international ties. And as a result, the Librarian Reserve Corps was established. 
and you can see on screen I've, I've got some of the founders and, and they just did amazing work. And particularly when we consider that at the time, it, it last, last year, the US government were actually in a bit of conflict with the World Health, World Health Organization and withdrew funding. So for American librarians to really push and see how important this was, it was actually a very brave step on their behalf. As you can also see, there are now, it's now expanded and there are over 13 countries ranging from Saudi Arabia, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Australia, <laughs> and uh, of course the United States. So it really has become a, a fabulous cooperative. So I've said how it came about, what do we actually do? Well, what we actually do is work with the World Health Organization and they have a, a subgroup, the GORAN, we keep hearing about, the Global Outbreak, Outbreak Alert and Response Network. And the, these are a group who um, jump in right at the beginning of a, of a, a major health or um, emergency situation. And WHO entrusted GORAN to run with looking after the information and published information that was out there. But as you'll see in a minute, it's not just the published information that we had to work with. So what do we do? Basically, we collaborate between librarians and the wider health community. Our expertise is to provide project skills, uh, certainly our indexing skills, and really quick turnaround times but with an emphasis on the need for accuracy. Most of what we do within health is evidence-based or what we call evidence-based practice. And this applies across a range of professions. It's not just health, of course. And in terms of the medical model, um, evidence-based practice consists of the clinical expertise. So our doctors, nurses, allied health people, what their knowledge is and their skills that they've built up over time. Very importantly, our patients' values and beliefs, but also the bit that we help with, the, help, the bit that the librarians help with, which is the research evidence. What is out there? What has been published? And how then can that be incorporated into the model of evidence-based practice? The Librarian Reserve Corps really important was, of course, it goes without saying, that we were looking at the latest relevant information. And the relevancy is highly important because, as you would all be aware, there was so much misinformation going around about COVID. Some of the things that we do, in addition to the indexing, and again, I'll talk about that a bit more, one of the main things that was being undertaken was literature searching. Now, it was a very different model than we may have undertaken if we were doing work for our hospital staff, for example. We were looking at a set of highly specific queries that were coming directly from the World Health Organization. So it could have been around um, looking at how how COVID is affecting pregnant women, for example, or uh, any other topic. And they would give us a question and various librarians around the world would take on a, a, a single topic and, and go away and do a literature search around finding information to support that thesis. As ordinarily, we would be searching in specific databases, but because of what was going on, much of the material was actually getting published to different sources. And if I jump to the next, next uh, slide, you'll get more of an idea of what sources of information we were having to look at. In addition to our usual databases, such as Med, Medline or PubMed or um, Embase, the usual Sonal that we use for health information, the material hadn't actually made it there yet. So material was being produced really quickly. Our clinicians were trying to share 
what they had discovered and what their information was. And they were doing this in a very different model than had been previously encountered. Traditionally, we would go through a process, the research would be undertaken, a paper would be written up, it would be submitted to a journal for consideration, it would go through peer review, and then it might go back to the authors for review for alterations. But the, the process of publishing can take up to two years, which, which now almost seems outrageous. We were seeing materials being produced from clinicians as letters to the editor. So people were, the clinicians were trying to share this information as quickly as possible. Social media, the Twitter um, accounts of clinicians sharing information was such an important source of information. And one of the biggest changes within publishing was the move to open access. And thankfully, publishers across the world agreed if the topic related to COVID, they would make that material open access. So where does that come with the Librarian Reserve Corps? In our indexing project, we, those who had been um, identified as being able to do indexing, or, which is almost an offshoot of cataloging, so assigning, assigning subject headings, ensuring that the um, citation materials are correct, we would actually uh, index materials, but we were having to go onto publishers' websites and get these materials. So we would have to be looking for open access materials. And a great deal of it was actually in languages other than English. Now, unfortunately, I don't have uh, skills in another language, but I was actually able to use a, an online translator to work and make sense of these, in, these records for indexing to be able to include or exclude them from our wider database. So this is just a, 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 a site that gives you, you can actually go onto this and have a look. These were just a few as examples of some of the literature searches that were undertaken. So ibuprofen, for example, and COVID-19, uh, best ways to disinfect hands. You can imagine that when water is scarce, so that's really highly relevant in, in many, many countries across the world. You can see how valuable some of these uh, literature searches were. And importantly, the timeframes, the turnaround times required for the supply back of information was very, very tight. Uh, if, if one was undertaking a systematic review, so um, a, a really big piece of writing on a topic, that, that's usually a six-month project. We were turning these uh, literature searches around in 24 to 48 hours, so it was a, a great deal of work, very highly skilled work, um, but to be able to contribute was actually very, very rewarding because we, we the, I say we, the health librarians, we knew we were actually we were making a difference. Uh, I've mentioned the WHO. This is the, their website if you want to go on and have a look. And, and the materials that we um, have indexed and the literature searches all end up on this site. So this is where, this would be the main site that, uh, one would go to search for COVID-19 information. Having said that, as, as a health librarian, I would do that in conjunction with searching on PubMed, for example, which is, um, under, which is developed by the National Library of Medicine in the United States. So if I, did, if I searched those two websites, even if I didn't search anywhere else, those two databases, I would have a pretty good I'd be fairly confident that I was retrieving the current information on the specific topic that I was after related to COVID-19. This is the actual search page from the um, Global Lit on COVID-19 from the WHO. And you can see that you can enter a, a straight question, you could enter a question or keywords um, the title uh, abstract you could enter to search by author, but fantastically, um, 
they've actually applied if, um, the ability to apply limits. So by which database do you want to search within? What is your main topic, main subject area? The type of study? Did it come from a particular collection? Um, and then you can look at the clinical aspect. If you're searching for health information or medical information, to be able to apply those limits uh, makes your searching so much more effective and accurate. And in applying the indexing, the indexes are the ones who identify which database it belongs to, what were the main subject areas, the type of study, et cetera, et cetera. So the better the indexing record, the easier or more accurate then it is for the retrieval of information when um, a researcher will go looking for a particular topic or subject. So a bit about me and, and how I ended up where I am or what I'm doing. Um, I'm the library manager or sole librarian for Redcliffe and Caboolture Hospitals Libraries. We've, um, I serve about 6,000 employees, but we have staff from uh, the kitchen, um, laundries through to our absolute top level professors uh, of medicine, nursing. Um, so I have a very different job. Every day is very different in, in what I do. Uh, I have two separate libraries, Redcliffe Library and the Caboolture Hospital Library, but I serve people at four different campuses. So in addition to Redcliffe and Caboolture, I'm also involved with a small hospital called Kilcoy Hospital, which is about um, an hour northwest of, Alice, of, of Brisbane. And I also serve the health staff at the Woodford Correctional Centre, one of our biggest prisons in Queensland. As it says, I'm a solo pro, um, professional health librarian. And my main clients out of all those staff are the clin clinicians, the nursing, allied health and medicine. My main roles are research, user education and um, managing the, the two library spaces. So how did I actually get involved? Well, I saw um, a call, the call go out on the um, Medical Library Association e-list in March, 2020 and put my hand up to volunteer. And I was really delighted again that they said, yes, that they'd like me, <laughs> they'd like me, they wanted me. Um, I, I did have to explain that I could actually do a few things to help. Um, and I actually ended up devising some of the instructions around the indexing because we'd started out and it was really, really basic. And uh, a lot of the people who were, were involved and, and volunteering to help, hadn't actually had much experience in indexing. So there was a tr training component as well. Um, I was in a position where I was able to do daily indexing of records. And I literally did hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of records. Every day I was sort of turning over a couple of hundred records. And that was in addition to my, my usual day-to-day um, -day work. I've continued to undertake um, advanced work, the, when, when the records are initially indexed, a component of them are, are set for review because somebody isn't quite sure if it fits the, the topic or not, or they could be languages other than English, and these go into a group. And, I, and again, I have set up instructions around how we can then um, sort these or consider them for inclusion into, into the wider WHO database. Um, that's been really <laughs> a big project. And I was, the, the first batch I did, which I finished uh, at the end of April, uh, was included 2000 odd records that were then able to be included back into the database. And a, another 600 that were, um, on topics that weren't really related to what we were doing. And you can imagine the, as soon as uh, a, a, an article has COVID-19 or pandemic or coronavirus in the, in the title or in the abstract, it will get picked up and put into the mix for indexing. Well, we had things like gone, um, 
is eating chicken going to cause coronavirus? All these really more obscure topics and these had to be sorted out and, and eliminated from the databases. But there needed to be an, a knowledge of health to be able to be an accurate indexer and to understand what was required. So moving into, if anybody has a bit of an interest in how they, they might be able to help around the Librarian Reserve Corps or and or health information. Um, I'll, I'll use this as a, as a platform to, to spout my, my favourite topic, which is information literacy and health information literacy. But if you're interested, particularly in the Librarian Reserve Corps, you can follow um, the LRC on, on uh, Twitter. There is a page to get involved, but I will say that at the moment there actually aren't any vacancies, but you can see what's going on. And every now and then the Libra Librarian Reserve Corps will run a, an event such as the one that was on, on screen that you can see on screen now that they held in April. Um, and they seem to do something probably once a month or so. There are certainly lots of papers that have been written uh, by the participants and by the, the leads within the Librarian Reserve course, so you can find out what else is going on. Oops, I, need, I, I hit the button twice and I thought, oh, I'm going to lose the slide I need, but it was fine. Okay, so what else can you do? Here are just a few things, really important. Um, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this coming from the public library background, that we have a very, very low um, health literacy rate within Australia. Uh, it's, it's quite frightening. And it affects so many uh, parts of our lives. Now, I can even say I have health, low health, information health literacy, because think about it, and you can think about this in your own terms too, when, when coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic first came on the scene, it was really scary for me because I did not have a, a knowledge of what is this about? What's going to happen? Da, 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 da. Now, I'm fairly well educated around health information. And if I'm having that sort of concern, how about the people who have no way to be able to go and check information themselves or can only rely on what's on the news or uh, whatever their friends or family are telling them. It's really important that we, we consider our colleagues and friends and associates and um, help them too around health lit literacy and ensuring an understanding of um, what is being discussed or what's out there in the media, whatever. And some of the things that you can do um, to help your clients improve their health information literacy and their, their critical appraisal skills, so how they understand information, how they make sense of that information, um, some, there are some really easy ones. And one is use plain language, so avoid those acronyms. And you have to excuse me, I know I said LRC a couple of times. Don't say LRC, say Librarian Reserve Corps. Spell it out. Um, I work in, a, again, as I keep saying, in a hospital environment, we are just renowned for having acronyms. And we'll talk about MNHHS. Well, that might mean anything to any of you, but to me, it means Metro North Hospital and Health Service. And even if I say that, it still doesn't make much sense. So it's really important that we try and avoid those acronyms and check our understanding, use open questions to confirm the understanding um, and encourage discussion with your clients. That's really important. Make sure that they're, they're getting it. Another, uh, this, this has just come out recently, SIFT, Warzel has uh, devised this around a, a news check, stop, investigate, find better coverage and trace the claim. So go back and, and look at where something has come from. Um, that's a really good, simple one. I'd, I'd like to teach that to all teenagers and, and uh, have them to be able to use that in their day-to-day -day, day -day life. And, of course, then there's the IFLA, um, the Federation of Library Associations 
um, how to spot fake news. That's a really good one. I put that poster up in, in both my libraries and I'm quite surprised for the people who are highly literate and yet they have they have got something out of that. And and um, if we first put this out in ooh, 2018, possibly 2017, but it's still as important today. Something else that you might like to participate in, um, ALIA, the Australian Library and Information Association, um, are running digital health literacy and provide some resources for libraries. So that may be something that, that you'd like to have a look at for either for yourself or for your library. And I mentioned earlier critical appraisal. Now critical appraisal is a, is a, a method to break down the content of material that you are reading. And it's, it's really like it's really aimed at health, but it can have a wider focus as well. You could apply these little checklists. And the ones that I use the most often are the critical, sorry, critical appraisal skills program, which is from the United Kingdom. And you actually get these checklists and you ask yourself questions as you're reading an article. Fantastic if you're studying or if you um, participated in a journal club, for example, where you're sharing information or you need to do a presentation, using a, a checklist and a critical appraisal um, approach to, your, to the work will really help you to break it down and, and make sense of, of what's in there. That's about it from me. I've just got some um, references and further reading. So these are up here, but they, they will be up on your wiki. Um, you're more than welcome to investigate those. Um, and I'd just like to, again, really acknowledge the, the work of particularly the um, initiators of the Librarian Reserve Corps. I, I jumped on their, on their back a bit and, and uh, I'm, I'm probably taking their glory, but, but really and truly those... Um, those women in the early days are the ones who deserve the credit. So I'm going back to Ellen, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jane. You've got Michelle, but thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions that we'd like to ask you if you'd like to stay on for a couple yes, of minutes for thank us. You. Um, but thank you again, um, as Nicola said, um, really important and thank you for sharing your insights. And um, really interesting and timely, your presentation, obviously, for all of us, and um, really quite, um, yeah, really good. So one of the questions we've got was, um, um, was your employer supportive of you volunteering during work time, or was this all during your own time? Yeah, oh, that's a that's a fabulous question. Yes, I I um, I'm a pretty organised person, and um, it it fitted with with uh, what I was doing because the we had a, such a change in the hospital environment in terms of what work we had to do day to day, and I um, as a health worker we were required to stay on on campus. Well, half my team did, part of my team as a sole practitioner I sit within the education team but um, I was one of the few in the education team who was on site every day and importantly the um, our emergency response team were actually based within uh, within this same building so I'm in a very small edu the education center it's a very small building but in the mornings I was basically doing um, I'll, I'll use an acronym there, SDI, so Selective Dissemination of Information, collecting together relevant um, currently published information for my emergency team that I would share with Redcliffe and Caboolture and the infection control um, experts. But then later in the day, because I wasn't doing the usual research, because nobody had time to be doing research, like traditional research, everyone was off just helping patients or getting set up ready to ready to go um, my organization yes were more than happy that I was participating in it and and that was that was I'm I'm very grateful for that too yeah oh, that's fantastic um, so um, we've had a few comments and Louise from George's Rivers suggested um, maybe we should have a, have a health literacy month or week initiative um, 
as a starting I would, point. Yeah. I would love to see that. I really would. Um, it's so important. Uh, with, with the Moreton Bay Regional Council libraries up here, a couple of years ago, I ran uh, some training there for their their librarians around what sort of resources and things, and and got them to have a look at their own websites and and what they were sharing. And, and yeah, and they said it made a difference. I hope it did. <laughs> yes. Um, um. Have you been able to work with local public libraries on any other health initiatives? Or uh, only, only, only the one the one that I've just said, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I would like to do more. And um, following this presentation, I've actually offered to give a talk to um, the Queensland group of ALIA and um, the public libraries here. So I'll see if, that, if, if that's of value to them. I hope, I hope they'll get something from it. Uh, um, um, Jane, a question from me. Were there other Australian um, health librarians involved in the um, work you just did? Or was it Jane? As far as I, as far as I know, no. Um, okay. Somebody, a, a couple of people expressed interest to me and I sent them the information, but I don't think anybody else actually signed up, but I apologise if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. Um, Wonderful. Did um, oh, um, I, I just question. saw Ellen's, yes. Ellen's query? Yes, the times time zones. The time zones actually really worked in my favour because um, the bulk of the information that was sent to me was coming from the US. So I was working basically in their night time, and therefore I could clear a lot of I say clear index a lot of material that couldn't be done in the in the US because the file wasn't ready to go if that makes sense yeah yeah no. so it actually really worked in in um, in our favor mm. wonderful okay um, does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask if you could put them in the chat that would be appreciated Okay, um, how did you and your colleagues cope with all the misinformation and conspiracy theories that were going yes. around? Yes, that's a very good question and it still is very much an issue <laughs> around vaccinations and I, 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 I try not to get into it. Um, I do remember having to leave a conversation when I was out somewhere and I just said, look, I'm sorry, I, I, I just do not have the same opinion and, and my, my, my comments are based on, on you know, um, the work that I do and, and, and understanding and I've looked at the index and, blah, 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 blah. and yes, so it can be tricky. Um, all I can do is point people back to reputable sources of information and um, talk about the evidence and um, the, the actual published research and, and what, what has been proven. And I think that the proof is really important. And, yeah, and did you come across any fake um, predatory papers in your search? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, interesting. Yes, very interesting. Yes, I I have um, in in uh, as uh, again a bit of it's around experience. You know which journals are reputable to start with within the health field, and suddenly we were sit, might see things pop up from you know Joe Blow's uh, latest work on coronavirus sort of thing and, and alarm bells ring. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So yes, yes. And and they very quickly get pushed aside. The the trouble with that though, or one of the concerning points is that um, media tend to pick up on the on the uh, you know the biggest and brightest and loudest and it, it isn't always the correct thing. And in fact I, I can I I nearly got fooled by one paper that came from Hong Kong. Um, and from supposedly a reputable, um, a reputable source, and within a week it had actually been discredited, and I and I actually felt, oh, that was a real wake up call for me. Yes. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. I think that's all the questions for now, Jane. Thank you so much for sharing your information, sharing your time today. On behalf of all the participants, thank you so much. We really appreciate okay. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye and enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the questions. Um, if you have any further questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat.
and we can actually send them to Jane and get some answers as well. Okay, so our next speakers have been working together for many months. They come from across the state and have been meeting online throughout the project um, without ever physically meeting, being together in the one room. And I'd like to hand over today to Eta from Tamworth Libraries, who's going to do an introduction and take you through. And unfortunately, you're going to hear from me again soon. <laughs> Thank you. All yours, Eta. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so I'm Eta from Tamworth Library, part of Central Northern Regional Libraries. Um, and I've been working together with Michelle, with Judy, with Rachel from Mudgee, and with Ellen from Foresight, like Michelle said, for the last few months online and we've been updating the reference excellence slides. So Michelle will bring our slides up, I think. Are they up? They're not up for me, but anyway, I'll just, there we go, no. I'll wait till Michelle has some up. Well, actually I'll just do, um, tell you what we're doing. So I will give, uh, give you an overview, the introduction to reference excellence, then Michelle will do a demonstration and Judy will um, tell us where we go from here. So first, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country for all three of us, because we're all in different parts of the country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. So I'm from Tamworth, Michelle's from Albury, Judy's from um, Coffs Harbour, and then we have Rachel from uh, Mudgee, the Midwestern Libraries, and of course, Ellen from Sydney State Library. So what is it? Reference Excellence is a self-based reference and information services training or a refresher training. It's designed to help public library staff provide excellent reference and information service training without individual libraries having to develop their own training. Public library staff from across New South Wales have contributed to the development and maintenance of this training. So what's the purpose? To develop your staff skills and of course your own skills as well, to focus on professionalism, to support the provision of accurate information. And we just heard from Jane how important accurate information is, especially health at the moment to enhance customer service and to encourage enthusiasm, because if you know what you're doing, you're gonna you know, have more enthusiasm to actually do it. So why did we do the update? I'll just wait for Michelle to click to the next slide. <laughs> I think she's having a sneeze attack. So why did we do the um, update? We wanted to stay relevant to library um, practices and stay current because libraries change all the time. And as we've all seen with COVID, um, all our practices went online, everything changed. So um, we undertook the whole update. And we wanted to renew the information. We wanted to update the examples and we wanted to ensure that all the links were accurate. And who is it for? In the first place for New South Wales Public Library staff, um, so it's for long-term staff, they can use it as a refresher or a renewal, like we said, everything changes all the time. Staff who are new to reference and information services, they can go through the whole program. There's 13 modules, so there's lots to learn. Um, library and information studies students can use it. So we have the TAFE students, we have um, university students using it, and anyone else who is interested in it um, is welcome to use the site. So how can you use it? You can use it as a team training in the library um, or whatever workplace you have. And you can do it with the whole team. You can do it as a buddy system. You can use it as mentoring. You can use it as an individual guided program in the workplace, or you can do it as an online training program. And often it's incorporated in um, studies like um, TAFE studies or um, university studies and we actually did it all online so you can definitely use it as an online program and Michelle was a little bit quick but how is it organized <laughs> it's a comprehensive training program so we have 13 modules and each module can stand alone but if it's the first time you're going to do it work through module one to six 
in order and then pick and choose whichever one you want to do or go through everyone as it goes. And each module has information, it has exercises, there's answers and discussion tips, and there's a review of the topic. And at the end, once you've done the module, there's an evaluation. And we ask you all who do the modules to fill it in so um, we can make any changes that are needed to the modules and we can keep up to date. So where can you actually find these reference excellence modules? Well, to show you where to find it and to have a little demo on how to use it, I'm going to hand over to Michelle from Albury. Take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Eta. I'm just going to get the next screen up for everyone. Okay, Michelle. And it's gone into, okay, we'll go into this one. Okay, so, so where can you find it? You can have the web address, which we will include in the chat facility, or you can open up the State Library web page from here. Go down, scroll down, don't get distracted by all the other information, and right down, keep going, and here, the wonderful green button for public library services. Go in here. You've got two ways you can access quickly from here. You can search wiki up here in the search bar and go wikis and blogs. Or you, again, you can scroll right down again to the bottom and click on wikis down here. Okay. So here's the State Library page of all the wikis and blogs that are managed and facilitated by the State Library from different service groups or different um, groups of people um, within libraries, public libraries of New South Wales. Our reference excellence wiki sits within the reference and information services group section here. And if we just click on it, we're going to go straight in. Okay, as Eta mentioned, we have 13 modules. They range from topics that are skills and techniques and the reference process to some uh, modules that deal with particular groups and typical particular reference questions you may come across through your career. So at the beginning, we have an about reference excellence. This gives you a brief introduction and some tips for using the wiki. And each module is made up of question contents, easy navigation section, information and exercises. And there are also separate answer and review pages for every module. I'm going to take us through basically module one, just to give a brief overview so we can have a good understanding or get to see how to drive the car before we actually go and um, give it a great run for its money. Um, so we've got the brief information on the left-hand side. At the top of each page, on the right hand side is your table of contact contents. This allows you to easily go from a section to another section. So if you happen to be in the middle of a module and um, you've got to go back and do your customer service or do some desk or have lunch, you can easily jump back into the area that you were on if you've closed your page. So you can go straight to the steps of the reference process. Within the module, you might find links to other modules. They're normally highlighted in the color green. You'll get a major point at the end of most sections, and there may be some exercises for you to work your way through. At the end of them, you can choose to go and check your answers while you're doing them, or you can check them at the end of the module as well. At the bottom of the module page is a link to all other modules and also a link to the answers and review page. Each answers and review page gives you a suggested answers for the questions and a review. The review is a, a wrap up what you have learned from the module. Also at the end of the page is an evaluation form. As Ita explained, we'd really appreciate if people could fill in the evaluation form for each module that they do. 
as it actually will help us to keep information up to date, pick up any links that have broken and improve the overall pages of reference excellence. Okay, so going back. So as you can see, we cover topics from the reference process, skills and questions, people skills, search strategies, reference resources, ethics and legislation. Then we go into the more um, specific titles of roving reference, answering local studies, family history, um, helping children, young adults, and then the more specialised of corporate library services and the technology references and services. I'm now going to hand over to Judy, who's going to talk through the next stages. Thank you, Eta and Michelle and, um, and Ellen in the background. So um, hello, everyone. And, and where to from here? Um, this is the next phase that we're moving into, where we're looking to you to contribute to the reference excellence modules. And there is a few ways that we're asking for your help and your involvement. Firstly, we're looking for photos to be inserted into each module, um, depicting different aspects of reference services. So it could be images showing a good way that you've got the reference desk configured. Uh, might be photos of your friendly professional staff helping their customers. Might be an example of how you undertake your roving reference and the way you deal with people in the different parts of the library and showing different examples of that. Um, and it could be a good display you've got of useful resources that you've set up. It, it could be any aspect really that will help other libraries and other staff build or develop the services that they are offering. And um, it will bring some colour to the pages as well and give it a bit of a personal touch. So um, we're, we're looking forward to seeing some contributions from everybody um, with those examples that we can include. Uh, the second way is um, if you have some templates that you find useful, please consider sharing them um, in, with the Reference Excellence Training Wiki. Uh, there may be templates for recording the details of frequently asked questions where you're not having to reinvent the wheel each time someone asks about a particular topic and you've got a way of recording that data in your systems that you use. Um, it might be something you use to record your statistics, um, to measure the services you're providing and, and gather that data together. Uh, it, it might be that you've put together an essential resources list for a branch library. So that would help other people if they're having to do that role as well and provide a, a succinct list of resources that you found helpful. Another aspect would be um, if you've got a template to reply to remote requests for information from either a chat service or an email request so that there's a consistency in the responses regardless of the staff member that's involved in sending that reply so that there's um, a professionalism about the way the replies are sent to the customer, uh, and particularly if you've got a, a, a way that you have a template to reply to say council staff or to school students who ask a question. Um, anything that helps set standards in place and improve professionalism would be really helpful to share with other people. Um, and the third request is that you submit the evaluation form. It's really helpful and I think we've all mentioned it. So it's, it's at the top of our minds that this is a way to continue to keep the, the service and the program current. Um, and it'll help us ensure the training meets the needs of the public libraries that we're serving or the students in library and information studies that are participating as well in the online program of this. It, it gives us an opportunity to evaluate what we're doing and, and make sure the information's relevant. So the, you could include any sort of comments in that evaluation form. It might be about how you've used the training in the workplace. It might be whether you found it easy or difficult, um, whether or not you came across any broken links, or just general feedback about your encounter with the whole PRAC package and, and, and how you benefited and how your staff might have benefited or, or used that program. Um, the other thing is we'd also suggest that you build this training program into your, your own professional development or into the professional development of your team members if you're in that sort of a position. It gives a focus for training, and it might be that you can tailor your staff development to a particular module of need for them. It might be you want to develop their skill in providing technology 
information request answers. So you could look to the module 13 specifically to do that particular training. So you can use this system in any way that works for you, but having that focused and measurable um, training opportunity is helpful all around and helps develop the skills of the staff that you're working with. Um, so to add content, you can become a Wiki member and contribute to this very worthwhile program. So you can see there's some email um, addresses on the screen there. And what we'd really like you to do is to add the templates or images to the Wiki directly. But if that's outside your comfort zone and you're not quite sure about how that all works, you could contact Eta, Michelle or Ellen. And um, Ellen has popped those emails in the chat as well. So they'll be available for everybody. And that way you can ask a question about what sort of things we might need or, you know, refine down what we're doing. So um, it, it's really worthwhile to be involved and that's a way that everyone can, can contribute. And um, Michelle demonstrated earlier about where the access to the wiki was down the bottom of the page with the big green button. Um, and you can join the email list as well. So that will keep you informed of all the other aspects of reference and information services apart from the reference wiki. And you've got the links there as well. So that gives you the opportunity to add these links into your, maybe into your staff intranet or distribute them out to your staff so they can participate and be part of that as well. And the direct link to the training program um, is available um, in the, we'll put that in the chat as well. So you've got a range of ways you can access the resource. So it's easy to get to and easy to do. So be brave, be involved and, and add your contributions as well. So um, finally, we'd really like to thank the State Library of New South Wales, the Public Library Services Branch for initiating this update and for Ellen Forsyth, who's been the catalyst to bring it all together and, and keep the project going. As was mentioned earlier, we all are in different parts of the country and we haven't ever, ever been in the same room as each other ever. We will one day, we're sure. But um, it's been a way that this project could be achieved um, online through Ellen's um, involvement and Ellen's help with getting that all happening. So we will also like to thank all the previous contributors that have added to the wiki in the past and created and developed the training. And also thank you in anticipation for your future contributions. So we support and encourage your staff and colleagues to also participate in the Reference Excellence Training. And if there's any further questions, you have the email contacts um, added to the chat and um, you can connect with the Reference and Information Services Group, join the email list and now you know where the wiki is, you'll be able to see all the other relevant information that's shared there. So thank you everybody and thanks for your listening today. So I'll hand back to Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have a question um, asking, does the wiki already have suggestions on how to keep statistics for reference inquiries? Oh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I don't think we have any templates. We're looking for some suggested templates. Um, to add to that page. So that would be good if you do have some, Maria. That would be really helpful. Um, as Judy mentioned, come and be a contributor on the wiki, or if you feel that you don't have the time um, and you would just like to email it to one of the party, feel free to email it to one of us. Okay. We've got some great comments here saying thank you and some people are really looking forward to looking um, rolling it out to some of their staff as refresher training. Um, so thank you everyone for that. Um, that's exactly why we've done it. Um, Ida or Judy, have you got anything else you'd like to add? And Ellen, who's hiding and <laughs> talking. Uh, the only thing I would add that just remember that it's the training is there for, for people to, to um, participate in. So if you've got people coming into your library um, I, I, as a TAFE teacher with TAFE Digital, I know that our students pop into their local library and ask questions of the staff at various times. They ask them to answer their, their um, 
assessment questions that they're trying to answer, then please take the initiative of suggesting they have a look at the reference excellence training. It is included in various modules of TAFE digital library and information studies. And I know Ellen had mentioned other training institutions also include it. So please remember that it is um, available to them to use and it's worthwhile. You could say, well, I'm not going to answer the question for you. Here's a way you can develop those skills that will help you move ahead with your own information literacy and your skill development. So that's another little aspect that you could use and high school students as well. Um, it, it's a good tool for them to use to develop their, their abilities. Yep. Rachel, do you have anything you'd like to add? Like you were um, quite involved at the beginning of it all. Um, no, I think you've covered everything. Unfortunately, I've been too busy and I haven't been able to contribute as much as you, but thank you so much for all your hey. hard work because it, it really is a mammoth task. So, Yeah, but you did some of the looking at afterwards. That yeah. You've been helpful, don't you? Know, yes. You've been very helpful. May I make a comment? Sure. I just say when you're editing, if you're looking to go in and um, edit the wiki, make sure that you really are improving it and it's not um, my favourite term for something. So really think about how it's going to improve the site um, when you're um, updating it. That would be terrific. And if you um, put in, uh, fill in the survey monkey form to become a wiki member, Kate Miley or I, we usually add you within a week, but if you have a wiki emergency, I've never come across anyone with a wiki emergency, but if you have a wiki <laughs> emergency, email one of us directly and we'll add you um, straight away. And I really do want to say, Eta, Judy and Michelle have been amazing in doing this. It's been a massive project and they have done it joyfully, uh, diligently, and with a great lot of thoughtfulness. So um, super impressed with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. It's been a um, great opportunity to work with other people from across um, public libraries across the state and um, get to meet some other faces. And hopefully we will get to meet in person. Um, but I would suggest or recommend to anyone else if you've ever thought of being part of a working group or that it's a really really great opportunity mm. and take it up if you've got support from your supervisors very worthwhile yep thanks again and thank you that was a really um interesting overview so thank you um Next, we have 10 slides in five minutes. Um, we have received one volunteer to speak, but when we do a call out, um, we do encourage you to volunteer to speak. Don't be shy, we're all friends here and there's so many people doing such wonderful things that we'd all love to hear about it. So, uh, so I'd like to introduce Kelly Woods from Shoalhaven Libraries. Um, Kelly will be talking about professional development, reading, listening and watching. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I wanted to see if anyone might be interested in joining a professional development book club um, or a book and article, journal article club. Uh, potentially, it would be a monthly reading group that could meet via Zoom and discuss articles or library science information titles with simultaneous loans in indie reads. Um, it would just be a chapter, I think. So we wouldn't we wouldn't go for the whole book. I think we could just do with reading it maybe a chapter from a book in Indie Reads. Um, if we use journal articles, it would need to be something available in the statewide library resources or through the state library subscriptions, just to, just to make it easy so that everybody can access the articles. Um, another option would be that we could read around the topic or a theme occasionally as well, which could be interesting to see what people um, bring along in terms of different articles, different books and different ideas to the discussion. Ellen has talked about this and we could create a space on the wiki and we could use the wiki as a bit of a platform and then use Zoom for the actual meetings that could help us stay on track. If you're interested in being involved, um, let us know in the chat or you can send me an email and I'll pop that in the chat in a minute. Um, I'm proposing that we meet on the last Wednesday of each month via Zoom and starting at the end of June. I'm not sure if morning or afternoon would suit everyone. So if you're interested, also let me know which time of day you'd prefer. And if the last Wednesday of each month is suitable, 
if you have any articles or chapters that you recommend to get us started, please also add that to your email. I'm open, open to ideas. Professional development reading is something that can get pushed by the wayside for me. So I'm hoping to have having this group going, we might um, get some structure and a little bit of accountability, which can be a good thing. Um, so if you feel the same, get in touch and I'll just pop my email down here for people. And that's it really. Thanks everyone. Hey, Ellen, is that all we've got? Thank you, Kelly. Sorry, I didn't realise my microphone wasn't down. <laughs> yes, no, there's just one. There was just one. Um, I yep. was thinking, though, if there are a few people interested, maybe we could have a brief um, discussion about that now. Um, the next yep. presenter is going to be punctually at 11, and we do need to have a little break between then and now. But if there are a few people interested, yep. um, if people aren't, that's also completely, um, yeah. Yep. But I think from oh. the chat, there's a few people who would be um, interested. Yep. And for yep. the Indie Reads ones, it's either individual titles, but the really? library juice titles have 30 simultaneous lines. And even if it's a small number of people, it's probably worth starting. Yeah. We don't yep. need to have, you know, although if all 53 people wanted to participate in, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Manageable um, reading amounts. Yeah, no, sounds wonderful. So as Ellen's saying, um, you're more than welcome to go for a break. If you'd like to join the professional reading group, can you please stay online for a couple of minutes so we can just talk through um, logistics a bit and... Um, go from there so if you are interested can you unmute your microphone and join in the conversation feel free to um do your video if you like um we're happy either way and so I can it'd be great if we can sorry i'll pause yeah. the recording now yes please joined by colin klein who is professor in the school of philosophy at the australian national university Colin will be speaking about the differences between mis, dis and malinformation and how to identify them, knowledge that is critical in the current climate. Colin will also discuss ways librarians can best provide assistance and education to the people in their communities by helping them become more aware of the information surrounding us every day. So thank you so much, Colin, for joining us. Oh, thanks, Kelly, and thank you all for being here. I think I am, um, unfortunately, I might be giving a slightly different talk than uh, you expected. So hopefully, it'll, but it'll be on the topic of conspiracy theories. Uh, and in general, some of the thing, looking a bit at why people believe them. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and I think, you know, I'll talk for a bit and then try to leave some time for questions at the end. So um, here we are. Share that. Go ahead and get started. So <clears throat> I've been, I'm a philosopher by training. I've been working on conspiracy theories for a while. Uh, I often like to give a bit of background about why, uh, since sometimes people think it's a, a bit unseemly of a topic, although it's become very politically relevant. So if you can't tell from the accent, I'm American. Uh, and I grew up in near Frederick, Maryland, which uh, has a large army base there. And my grandfather worked at the army base. And one of the things he did, as did many people at Fort Detrick, was help to weaponize anthrax during the Cold War. 
So Fort Detrick was the center of the Army's biological warfare program. Uh, and it's a bit of a strange thing to grow up with because you know, my grandfather never talked about his work, but many other people you know, kind of knew. And there were all these urban legends when you're a kid. So there was building 470, which has since been demolished. But at the time it was bricked up. And of course, when you're a 12 year old boy, you get all these rumors like, you know, there had been an anthrax leak and everyone died and they're all kind of sitting there still dead at their desks and it's sealed up for a thousand years and so on. And yeah, you know, that was not true. I think it was actually asbestos that was the problem. But, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. And I think over time, what I've realized is in the US, a lot of you get stuff from leftover from the Cold War and a lot of these sorts of things make people really distrustful and it's a breeding ground for conspiracy theories. So, you know, about five, six years ago now, I started doing some work on online forums, particularly Reddit, uh, using some computational techniques to look and see why people were engaging with these forums, which are reasonably popular. And, uh, you know, you kind of see conspiracy trends come up through them. And one of the things we found, and one of the things that this kind of theme that's going to run through this talk is actually the diversity of people uh, who get into conspiracy theories. So you find, you know, there's this stereotype of the guy in his basement with a tinfoil hat and all he does is post on the internet all day. And there are people like that. Like you definitely see people like that, but there are actually also quite a lot of what you might think was otherwise ordinary people who are willing to engage and take seriously conspiracy theory with conspiracy theories online. So I wanna talk about, there are many, many things you can say about why, and in some sense, there's no single answer to what brings people to conspiracy theories. But to get started, and because I'm a philosopher and we like definitions, just to get one on the table, it's important. So the kind of ingredients of a good conspiracy theory, sometimes people just talk about conspiracy theories as a, a kind of catch-all uh, kind of negative word for someone's bad beliefs. But I think what you find, so say this idea that, you know, the CIA assassinated JFK. Uh, you get a couple things that are common. So you get a kind of accepted narrative, the, the quote unquote official story that explains things. You also get a group of powerful people who are actually working behind the scenes, so counter to the official narrative. And those people provide the real explanation of what's going on. But they're concealing their own role. And the reason why they're doing it, or part of how they're doing it, is by propping up the official narrative. So, you know, the CIA is actually the one who killed JFK, but then they set up Oswald to look like a patsy and so on. Now, I'll come back to this in a second, but one thing I wanna mark off and in, in the kind of academic literature around conspiracy theories, there's a big split in this. One thing I don't have here is that it's actually false. So you can get a, a list, and this is a list that was largely taken from online sources. Uh, so, you know, JFK was assassinated, the moon landing was faked. Uh, and you go through, but some of these uh, you find out and you go through are actually true. Uh, and at times have been considered conspiracy theories. In some sense, they're still formally conspiracy theories. Uh, famously about the spy agencies taping everyone. This was a running example in a, a conspiracy theory paper from the 90s that turned out to be largely true. And I think it's worth emphasizing this. So I want to say, you know, most conspiracy theories that you're going to come across, I think, are probably wrong. They're false, and it's harmful to believe them. I think it's, you know, one doesn't have to work too hard to make that case anymore. But it's worth pointing out that a lot of uh, what seem like kind of uh, strange conspiracy theories on the surface of it have deep roots. So uh, this is a this is actually from the reissue of Ice Cube's Predator, which has a, a bunch of conspiracy theories in the first song. But one thing you find, so you look, for example, at vaccine hesitancy among African-Americans in the US, which is quite high, but almost always, if you try to trace this back, what you find out is, for example, the legacy of the Tuskegee experiments, uh, where African-Americans who were infected with uh, syphilis in, in rural US, where they withheld treatment essentially to see what happened. So these terrible, this terrible legacy of experimentation on African-Americans in the US, and that's the kind of seed that, and everyone agrees that happened. That wasn't even particularly, um, uh, they weren't even particularly quiet about it. So, you know, you get that and that continues on. And I think it's worth pointing out, and this is something that I suspect you guys will see in your own practice as well, that people who come to conspiracy theories, even if they're fairly outlandish, often have some historical event in mind. Now, <clears throat> But what I think is really key on this, and just from a philosophical point is very interesting, 
is this idea that it's not just that there are powerful people doing bad things, because everyone thinks that happens. It's the cover-up that's really important. So I mentioned briefly one of my favorite conspiracy theory papers. Uh, this is dead and alive belief in contradictory conspiracy theories. What they showed was that you know if you take people who believe in conspiracy theories, uh, they often believe in things that seem contradictory. So for example, that Diana was killed by a rogue cell of uh, British intelligence versus uh, they were killed by uh, Al-Fayed's business enemies. Both of those can't be true, but yet people who believe one tend to believe another. Or in another one, they have a correlation between believing that Osama bin Laden is still alive and believing that he was already dead when the Navy SEALs got there. And you might think, like, you can't think both of those are true, right? And so sometimes this seems like conspiracy theorists are just uh, completely irrational. But in fact, what you find is if you look a little bit more that really the core belief is that officials are engaged in some kind of cover up. And when people say that Osama bin Laden is still alive or that he was dead before the SEALs got there, what they're really expressing is a, a, a kind of distrust of the official narrative. So that's the kind of core. And then the details are kind of flexible. Now, one of the reasons that this makes conspiracy theories particularly challenging and particularly challenging to uh, push back against is that there's a kind of one-way ticket. And I suspect all of you are familiar with this sort of phenomenon because you say, well, look, you know, I think the official story about 9-11 is true. And someone says, well, look, uh, I think that Bush did 9-11 to provide a pretext for invading Iraq. Now I'd say, well, look, here's this report from the NTSB about what happened when the planes hit the tower. And then someone says, oh, well, look, but obviously I don't believe them either, right? So that's part of the cover-up. And once you start thinking that things are part of a cover-up, you have fewer and fewer sources of accurate evidence. And you have to turn to things like shady websites and so on if you wanna find any more information. So there's this kind of one-way ticket here represented by a traditional fish trap where you, know, you start with what seems like maybe reasonable doubt in sources of evidence, and you move from there until you get to a very odd place, and it's very hard to draw you back. Now, sometimes people say this like, well, you shouldn't give up on sources of evidence, but one of the tricky problems, and indeed one of the things we kind of rely on librarians to do for us, is precisely that there are many terrible sources of evidence that you should discount. So this is from a British tabloid. You see the headline, Gordon Ramsay sex dwarf eaten by badger. Now, this, there's actually a true story behind this, but the sensationalist headline, you, I, I take it everyone sees this and thinks, you know, whatever's going on here, I probably shouldn't put too much stock into it, and rightly so. So everyone has to make decisions about uh, evidence. And it's easy to say you should think for yourself, but in fact, and one of the things that philosophers often emphasize is that we're all deeply dependent on the testimony of others for what we know, we have to trust other people if we're going to know almost anything. So when I talk to students about this, you know, I point out, um, and, you know, this is the reason why we have libraries and libraries are good, right? That, you know, I've never been to, you know, most countries in the world. How do I know they're there? Mainly because I've looked at atlases. I know what food penguins eat, but I know that mainly because, you know, I read it in a book. So I have to trust other people and I have to trust that I'm getting mostly accurate information. And I have to be at the same time a little bit careful about where I get that source of information, but it's that kind of trust that conspiracy theories end up exploiting, both in the sense that uh, they try to foster distrust in accurate sources of information while still like drawing you in uh, and getting you to trust what turn out to be inaccurate sources of information. And they do this precisely by this focus on cover-ups. Now, <clears throat> In terms of why people get engaged with conspiracy theories, I think there are three broad types. What I wanna to do today is actually just talk about one of them to leave some time for questions. And the one that I think is kind of, I was trying to think of how the Library Association might be uniquely poised for this. And I think there is a way in which, you know, most of us can't do anything about Facebook. Most of us can't do anything about, uh, you know, people's individual proclivities, but you guys actually have an in on this. So let me, let me point, the three standard things. One is there's a lot of individual explanations. So there's a lot of work in psychology about 
you know, do you, or are you more likely to believe in conspiracy theories if you see patterns uh, or if you can pick out patterns more easily or if you feel disempowered or if you're angry or these sorts of things. And these kind of explain why some people believe and other people don't. There's also a lot of focus on social explanations. So you think about social structures like the role of media or the role of social media in spreading around information uh, or the role of you know, powerful people in promulgating conspiracy theories or political ends and so on. So it explains why certain kinds of societies rather than other ones end up with more conspiracy theories. Uh, and there's, again, both of these are quite interesting. There's a lot of work about public trust, for example, and how it interacts with that. There's a third kind of explanation, which there's some work on, and I think is actually really interesting. It's the kind of underexplore the third option. There's actually what are called narrative explanations. So this is a focus on, you know, the conspiracy theories themselves as stories. Remember I said that there's an official, the structure of a conspiracy theory involves an official story and a response to that and a kind of, you know, a true story about what's really going on. And I think actually this sort of focus on like conspiracy theories as narratives ends up explaining a lot. So, oops, this is not supposed to go in, but so this is the one I wanna focus on. I wanna talk, say about some kind of, you know, thinking about conspiracy theories in particular as a type of shared narrative with distinctively narrative features. So, you know, one thing, so I'm a big fan of James Elroy. Uh, he's great. Uh, and, you know, he's got this, uh, I think American Tabloid is the first of a trilogy about the JFK assassination. And what's interesting is, you know, he's got this whole thing. There's the CIA in there, there's the Cubans, there's drug runners, there's all, it's like a really compelling, really gripping story that runs up to the JFK assassination. And it feels like a conspiracy theory, except, you know, I mean, Elroy's drawing on stuff people have said, but it's a fiction. Like many of the characters involved are fictional characters, but in some sense, it doesn't matter. Because you know it feels about as good as a JFK conspiracy theory as anything else, except for the fact that you know you guys shove it in fiction. And what does it have? Well, it's got this kind of you know standard narrative arc. It's got the exposition, so you know you're telling the story. It's got a lot of stuff going on in the background, right? And then there's more and more action, and it gets to the climax of the assassination, and then there's a kind of falling action and a resolution, and then there's some more assassinations in the later books and so on. So it's really, it's got is this kind of emotional arc to it. And one of the things that I think is really important about conspiracy theories as opposed to official stories, I'll come back to this with a particular example, is that often the official story does not have a particular emotional arc to it. So <clears throat> the philosopher David Velleman has a really nice uh, paper on what he calls narrative explanations. And he says, well, the important thing about a narrative explanation, a narrative is like, explanation is putting something in the form of a story. And he says, a story enables an audience to uh, assess events, or sorry, to assimilate events, uh, not to familiar patterns of how things happen, but uh, to familiar patterns of how things feel. So it's not just that it's something that happened a lot. Uh, it's not like the JFK assassination conspiracy theories assimilated to other political assassinations, for example. Rather, they assimilate it to this kind of the feeling that you get from a good story. So I was talking with a friend of mine the other day and sent me this. She's like, by the way, do you know about COVID conspiracies? My housemate sent me this. So recent outbreak, you know, recent back in the news of this is a, a Wuhan lab and COVID outbreak from that and so on. Now, regardless of like what you think of the truth of this, I'll come back to a little bit of that later. Here's what I think is the interesting thing about a lot of COVID conspiracies, right? So the official story is really, it's, it's unsatisfying, it's boring. Right? The official story is like somebody ate maybe a bat in a Wuhan wet market, they got some coronavirus, didn't get locked down quick enough, and now everyone's sick. Oh, we've all got to stay you know, in Australia for at least another year. Uh, that, that's, that's boring, it's just kind of pointless. Um, and it's not just that it's sad, uh, but it's actually that it's got no story to it. Whereas, you know, you start thinking about lab outbreaks, and now you start thinking of these movies, right? There's like the panicked scientist slamming his hand on the red button trying to close the door, but it's too late. Uh, there's a cover up, there's secret people, maybe there's some assassinations. Like, who knows? You can spell this out. Even if in some ways it's worse for you overall, it gives you the kind of emotional satisfaction of a good story. 
And that makes it feel, I mean, as Valen puts it, it makes it feel like it's more likely to be true. So one says, you know, I'll skip over some of this. We say, look, the audience is uh, liable to make, think that they've made sense of a historical event uh, by feeling about how they came about. So this is the key. So having sorted out, uh, the audience having sorted out its feeling towards events, it mistakenly feels like it's sorted out the events themselves. It mistakes emotional closure for intellectual closure. So the idea with a lot of this is that what conspiracy theories have, often far more than the real life stories have, is this feeling of emotional closure, even if it's bad closure, even if it's tragic. It gives you a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and that itself is, you know, is powerful. So, you know, one example I use on this, not all conspiracy theories have this, but the ones that don't are extremely unpopular. So I'm actually like kind of personal favorite conspiracy theory. Uh, this is from uh, the manager book, Mortal Error. Uh, so it's a conspiracy theory about Oswald, or sorry, about JFK. It says, look, Oswald was there. He doesn't know why, doesn't care. Takes a shot at JFK. Secret service agent in the follow-up car jumps up to respond and accidentally shoots Kennedy in the back of the head. Uh, that's it. That's the entire conspiracy theory. They covered it up because it was super embarrassing and there was already a guy who was there anyway. Uh, so might as well blame it on him. <laughs> so there's a whole book. It's got a lot of diagrams. It's like really, you know, well-argued as far as, you know, as, as well-argued as any of these things go. But my impression is it's kind of universally hated among conspiracy theorists and why? Well, it's got the structure of like a shaggy dog joke, right? So you've got like, there's something that happens, there's something that happens, and it's just a big accident and everyone's kind of embarrassed. And so there's no emotional closure there. And that's why even if in some sense, you know, as far as the evidence goes, it's about as good as anything else, no one likes it as a conspiracy theory, precisely because it doesn't give you that, that feeling of tying things off. Now, there are a bunch of different ways of thinking about narratives. I want to because I want to leave plenty of time, I'll, I'll go through this slightly quickly. When you might distinguish, when people talk about narratives, there are sometimes two different kinds of narratives. So one is what I call ideological narratives. This is by the Alex Jones, host of Infowars, the notorious US conspiracy site. And you get both of these. Sometimes uh, we think of ideological narratives. Uh, so these are stories about how the world is organized, who has power, how it's structured, that sort of thing. And here, I think these are classic like Marxism, feminism, oh, by the way, that these are, these are not necessarily false narratives, but um, Freudian psychoanalytic theory has this. And one of the things about these narratives is they have a kind of built-in story about why there's a cover up. So in Marxism, the proletariat is oppressed because you know, the, the capitalists keep them down and control the media. In feminism, it's patriarchy. In Freud, it's repression. So you've got this story about how the world is organized, and that includes a kind of conspiratorial element to it. Now, those are, many people find these very satisfying. They also have this quality that they're sort of hard to talk your way out of uh, if you're really embedded in them. There's another kind of narrative though that I think you find even more often in conspiracy theories, which we might call revelatory narratives. So these are the, the really classic revelatory narratives are of course religious conversion narratives. So, you know, that Paul on the road to Damascus, um, you know, the angels coming down and so on. And you often find this kind of language in online conspiracy theory, and this kind of, I was blind, but now I see, like, once I was just wandering around in the dark like everyone else, but now everything makes sense. So this real feeling that it's not just part of the narrative is not just the stories about, you know, how the world works, but the story about who you are and how you relate to the world. Uh, you get, I mean, this is more kind of online toxic masculinity is basically taking this idea of the red pill as their motto. Uh, this is supposed to be the like, like Neo and the Matrix, you go online and then you discover that modern feminism is all bunk meant to keep men down and so on. Uh, but again, it's got this sort of narrative, not just about the world, but about yourself and your place in it. And again, these needn't be false. Uh, you know, there's a really common like addiction narratives. This is Bill Wilson from Alcoholics Anonymous. You often find this kind of thing in addiction narratives as well and overcoming addiction. Uh, and it's important there. I mean, so this is just to say revelatory narratives don't have to be suspect, uh, but also that, you know, they're quite powerful. So part of the power, if you look at a lot of recovery narratives, for example, is the, you know, 
this is where I was, this is what happened, and this is how I've been you know, made anew. So conspiracy theories, there's a very nice paper. This is also my favorite. This was from an academic journal, but I, this is like the best figure in an academic journal. Uh, you know, have this kind of, uh, this is Frank said, I'll have this paper that say, well, look, actually, when you talk about conspiracy theorists, the more they're embedded, the more it tends to go from sort of theories about particular events. And there are a lot of people say on Reddit who really just care about a few kinds of things. US foreign policy, gun control, that sort of thing. But the people who post more and more and more and more topics tend to think of themselves as undergoing this kind of hero's journey or hero's quest. Now, <clears throat> to, to go back to this idea, um, I think this, you know, we say you, you can't think for yourself, but there's a sense in which these revelatory narratives are attractive in part because they kind of imply that you've broken away and you don't need other people. Uh, that in some sense, you're, you're able to see what most people can't and so you're above them. I do wanna point out, and this is a, something now I insert in every talk. One thing that's interesting though, is you, know, you go back to that list of conspiracies that, ever, that actually happened. Uh, if you look down through the list, how do we know things about Tuskegee? Well, that's actually because they were published. How do we know things about, you know, the CIA had this long program trying to give people LSD uh, as a mind control drug. We know that because of a House Select Subcommittee. In general, basically all of the conspiracies we know uh, you know, actually happen, have been done by either reputable scholars using reputable means or the official institutions and, you know, organizations of government. No conspiracy has ever actually been uncovered by amateur sleuthing or by like dude on the internet, essentially. So, <clears throat> so I come back to all this and I wanted to, you know, talk about some of this stuff uh, with you guys, partly because, you know, in some sense, as librarians, one of the things that you're really engaged with a lot, I mean, I realize, you know, my mom used to work for a library, like I realized like librarians jobs are multiple and complex, but the, the if you, hopefully the core of it still involves at least something about books and something about the narratives contained in them. So, you know, and that's one of the p reasons why people like the library, they like the books you have is because they have good stories. So you guys are in some sense uniquely poised to think about the role of narratives in people's lives. And in some sense, if people come to you, you know, often what they're looking for when they say, you know, oh, well, look, I heard the coronavirus vaccine uh, is made by Bill Gates uh, and will make us all into mind control slaves or whatever's going around now. They're not, deep down, it's not a question of, of fact because the question of fact is very obvious there, that's absurd. It's a question about stories and the kind of narrative they can tell about the world and the narrative they can tell about themselves. Now, unfortunately, it's much easier to figure out the, um, you know, figure out the problem than to give you solutions. But I do want to mention one paper that came out recently. Uh, this was in PLOS, I think, possibly Nature 2020 in any case, talking about fake news online. And one of the things it found was that, you know, if you ask people, should you pass on fake news? Should you pass on conspiracy theories? Nearly everybody says the important thing is not that it agrees with me. It's not that it sounds funny or interesting, but that it's true. People are also really willing to pass on information that's clearly not true. And even that in other points they've judged is not true. If it's funny or interesting or politically aligned or so on. So it seems like the kind of narrative aspects of this, as I'm calling it, of a lot of fake news things are what make people pass on that stuff. But if you prime them, so this is a, what happens in uh, survey five, this is their, you know, the treatment condition and the important treatment condition. Um, if you prime people to think about, you know, what's important, like that truth is important, not just being a good story, not just fitting what you think, but you prime them in some sense, just by asking them, I think most of the treatments here were just asking people, what do you think is important? And they say truth. They're actually much less likely to pass on false information. So bringing things back away from the kind of good storytelling aspects of conspiracy theories or fake news and bringing them back towards the, you know, just prompting the truth is often a really important part of the process. And one that, you know, everyone can do, but given you know, many, particularly the public facing uh, members of your organization might be especially well poised to do as a kind of, you know, small but very helpful practice. So plenty more to say about that. I want to leave some time for questions. I also want to thank the Australian Research Council who's funded some of this. 
uh, that and who pay the bills. This is many of the people I've worked with. The, the people near Telstra Tower are the ones that uh, the grant is on, and the people on the right did some of the earlier work on Reddit with me. So, and with that, and if you want to get in touch, that has my email and also um, my website, which has a lot of this work on it, and my Twitter handle if you want to chat more. So I'll end that there, and uh, that should leave us with some time, hopefully, for questions. Ah, and I will stop the chat too. Thanks, Colin. That was so interesting. Great. I, I thought the narrative and the story perspective was was really interesting. I've never thought of it like that before. Hmm. Um, yeah. Good. I've been great. trying to sell that recently. So mm. <laughs> that's okay. You guys Make are what was hopefully the uh, the um, sympathetic audience. Yeah. No, it makes sense to me. Definitely. We all love a good yarn. Yeah. You know, it's easy to get sucked into a good story, isn't it? Well, I think about it too. I mean, you know, I, I joke about this sometimes because I'm in meetings here, you know, and as an academic and we and we talk about how important it is truth and then we we sit around in you know the break room and everyone's like and i heard they're gonna take away our offices and put them us all there and then we're gonna take away the parking structure and we're all gonna have to walk over and it's like yeah i heard that too like and they're lying about it but it's you know that kind of gossip it fits in with this kind of gossip like you know this feeling that people are you know people are manipulating you and so you've kind of got to pass on what information you know it's a very kind of uh you know, it's a very natural kind of thing on the small scale. And I think there's a sense in which everyone's kind of a small scale conspiracy theorist about their, at least about their workplace and about, I don't know, their state government or something, so. Yeah, definitely. Can you, can you quickly just run through miss, dis and mal information? You talked about that at the ALIA conference, I think, and it was, was that, did you talk about it? That wasn't actually me. One of the guys that you were with on the panel. Yeah. So, I mean, I can say a little bit about it. So what was his descent between Miss Dis and Mal? Um, I mean, one has, often, yeah. Yeah. So oftentimes people will distinguish between three different ways that something online can be false or anything. Um, so something can be you know, it's kind of misinformation in the sense that someone can pass on uh, information that's designed to confuse people, or sorry, that's designed to be wrong. Mm. There's also information that's just designed to confuse people. And often mm -hmm. this is a, you know, in some sense, misinformation is the stock in trade of you know, some political parties. A lot of bad news sources are just you pass on something that's wrong and in some sense this is a familiar thing people sometimes people tell the truth sometimes people lie there's often a, a kind of interesting uh alternative which is sometimes called disinformation uh, i've heard malinformation used for this as well so i don't want to step on someone else's toes where the point is not so much to uh get people to believe a false thing but just to undermine confidence and truth in general so you know, a lot of anti-vaccination information, for example, it's not necessarily to get people to believe something else. It's just to kind of undermine the general system of trust. So, mm -hmm. you know, I say, look, I heard that Bill Gates is putting chips in vaccines so that 5G wireless can control you. In many cases, what happens is it's not that most people believe that. Most people believe that that's kind of silly. But the net effect is for people to say, well, maybe I should be a little bit more hesitant about vaccines, or maybe I should not trust this sort of thing. So you get this kind of, you know, these disinformation campaigns, really the point is just to make people not sure what they're supposed to believe, not to believe something false or to believe something true. And in many ways that can be more damaging because if what you're doing is undermining trust in, for example, institutions, then you start getting that one way trip problem that I talked about in the talk, right? Because, you know, if you undermine your uh, belief in, you know, I don't know, the government health organizations, well, of course, they're going to have lots of accurate information about why you should trust them. But now you don't trust them. So you don't trust the accurate information, and so on. So it's very hard to get back. Mm -hmm. um, and you can tell sometimes it's just this, sometimes it's done maliciously, sometimes it's just done accidentally. Uh, but it is an important distinction between information that's meant to be you know, 
meant to try to get to someone to believe something false and just information that's meant to confuse or undermine the kind of confidence in the process overall. Yeah, sure. We've got some questions over in the chat. Um, we've got one from Fiona who said that conspiracy theories have always been with us, think witches and somewhat controversial, somewhat controversial aspects of religion and religious belief. How do current conspiracy theories align with, say, the time before TV, radio and the internet? That's a really good question. I mean, I think you get... So I only know some of the historical elements of this, but you certainly get things. So there are kinds of conspiracy theories that have been around for ages and that you still get in modern forms. The two obvious ones, one other thing I didn't talk about in this, but there's, you know, one of the groups we find consistently online that's very identifiable in terms of conspiracy theory is racists. So there are racist conspiracy theories and some of the particularly anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are extremely old. They go back to the Middle Ages uh, and you get variants of them that pop up you know, in some cases, the very same kinds of claims over and over. Uh, now, some of these are specifically about Jews. A lot of them, I think, are just general out in-group versus out-group conspiracy theories. So you've got a majority and then the the kind of oppressed minority, you say, well, secretly they're stealing our babies or that sort of thing. There are also health-related conspiracy theories, I think, are quite common. I was reading this fascinating discussion about um, when people thought that cholera outbreaks might be caused by telegraph lines. Uh, so this was the, when the telegraph had come across Europe and then across Russia. And one of the reasons why was because telegraph lines were laid along railway lines. So they, um, you know, the cholera and disease outbreaks could spread more quickly along rail lines. So it wasn't, there was actually a correlation. But I think one thing that you find, that I find in a lot of contemporary conspiracy theories that goes back so it's talking a bit about this idea of like gossip and rumor and people trying to pass on information things where we you know there are certain things and i think these are things about children about your health um where you think look you have this kind of better safe than sorry attitude like if someone's around stealing children you know it's probably better to pass that information on than to like you know get it wrong if something's going to make you really sick, I mean, there's all kind of, you know, coronavirus, especially in the early days, it was basically just this wash of like, I heard if you do this, you'll be fine. I heard if you do that, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the instinct behind this, if you think that the world is kind of complicated and there are bad actors covering up information, there are certain topics uh, that are really, you know, really grab you and you're much more likely to pay attention. Whereas stuff like the moon landing was fake or the the earth is flat and NASA's covering it up. Like those are always kind of fringy. Um, and I think they, they don't have that immediate connection to the safety of you and your loved ones that really draw people in and make them more willing to entertain uh, complex hypotheses. I suppose the religious ones, I mean, I think that's a good one to bring up. You know, if you're worried about your immortal soul, uh, so you know, I grew up when I, I was a kid in the 80s in the US where it was the kind of satanic panic uh, era. So this idea that Dungeons and Dragons was secretly turning kids into Satanists or Halloween was going to, you know, when the Satanists came out. Again, I think some of the worry there was that, you know, well, it's better safe than sorry. Why play this silly game if it might like send you to hell, that sort of thing. So that, uh, those things have a really powerful emotional charge to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then that links into the kind of stories that you're able to tell about them as well, because it makes the stories immediately more engaging. Yeah, right. So if if you were talking to a person who believed in the whole coronavirus conspiracy, because I've met people who do. Oh, and yeah. It was, a, it was a really weird moment. And I was just, what would you recommend? That, like, if you know, what do you recommend we say or do in those conversations yeah i mean there are a few things you can try so one thing is it's very hard it's very hard if someone's already quite entrenched in believing in conspiracy theory unfortunately there's very little you can do um there's another paper which i didn't put in here but i should uh, i should add for the next time i do this uh about the effectiveness of personal narratives over um, fact-based narratives for talking to people. So talking about, you know, it's a, unfortunately a bit tricky in Australia because we haven't had much impact 
uh, from coronavirus in some ways, but a lot of, you know, a lot of the advice in the US is to talk about friends, talk about relatives, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. who have been impacted by it. Um, there are a few things, a, a kind of standard checklist that I talk about sometimes. So one thing you can do is, you know, rather than going straight at the facts on it, because most of the things you could say they would have heard before anyway, try to take a step back and figure out. So often there's a core of distrust and figuring out where that core of distrust comes from is really important. So is it distrust of pharmaceutical companies? That's what you get with a lot of anti-vaccination stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, those are things where it's not entirely unreasonable to distrust pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, in particular cases, it's often wrong. But, you know, so trying to figure out first where that distrust comes from, uh, oftentimes trying to get people to focus on whether their sources should be trusted anymore uh, is a useful exercise. So I find this, you get people who are like, I don't read the New York Times, uh, but also woke dude 420 on Reddit told me that he read a thing, he knew a guy or something like that. And you think, well, look, you know, these people have agendas as well. The other thing that I think it's not everything works like this, but one thing that's often a useful exercise to try to get people to contemplate, there's a, some nice papers on this as well, is how many people would have to stay quiet for a conspiracy theory to work versus basically how terrible anyone is at ever staying quiet about it. So if you look at the successful conspiracies in history, they tend to involve uh, very small numbers of people who are highly motivated not to talk about things because they're typically like directly responsible. Compare that to coronavirus conspiracies that involve, you know, every GP, uh, every member of parliament having to, you know, all knowing what's going on and keeping quiet about it. The, you you kind of think like, look, stuff leaks out all the time. There's no reason for people to stay quiet about this. If that were true, we would have already heard about it by now. Uh, I often use the example, you know, I once it's a, a, was reading a long thing by a police officer explaining about interrogations, basically that, you know, most police interrogations are just like you wait long enough and people will talk about the bad stuff they did because they really like talking about it. Uh, so, you know, it's very hard to keep anything a secret. And the conspiracy theories that require massive numbers of people to keep a secret are the least plausible ones. And draw, again, drawing people's attention to that. And again, it comes back to, I think, thinking about, well, what do you know about human nature? Would people really stay quiet about this sort of thing? Um, now, some of them and the more committed ones, you can get kind of, uh, you get stories about this. And in some sense, you can amp this up even more Eventually, you can start, you know, becoming skeptical about, you know, whether there's coronavirus, whether China even exists. You know, this, I am a philosopher. Who knows? Maybe the world doesn't exist. Uh, it, it, it's all a mystery. Um, but I think for people who are on the fence about this, kind of drawing attention to some of these facts about, you know, that who you're trusting with your information and why you're distrusting other sources and also just the sheer number of people who would have to keep quiet. Um, those are two useful exercises to start uh, to get people. And I think also one of the, one thing that I've been emphasizing and I think is worth uh, pointing out with a lot of this stuff is that talking about conspiracy theories with people who believe them, you know, it's often a very delicate interpersonal matter. Uh, expecting people to change their minds right away is often you know, unreasonable. But one thing you can do is kind of plant the seeds of where they could go to look for true information. So I've never heard of anyone just changing on the spot and saying, oh yeah, I guess you're right. You know, Bill Gates probably didn't put chips in the vaccine. But if you can plant the seeds of like, well, you know, here's where you can get accurate information. Here's why, you know, the sources you're trusting might not be trustworthy and so on. Often that's the beginning of a process that leads to people reevaluating what they believe. So there's a certain modesty you have to have as well, but I think there's a lot of good stuff you can say to sort of start steering people in the right direction. Yeah, so it's about steering them back towards the truth, like what yeah. you mentioned before. And so, yeah, Ellen has said that in the comments to help reduce the interest in sharing stories which are not true, but might be a good story. Like we need to steer them back towards the truth, especially from a health perspective. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's why, you know, you see a lot of these public health or public health campaigns that focus on, you know, individual people's stories. Um, 
I, you know, I find them when I already believe the thing they're doing, I find them slightly cheesy, but apparently they work pretty well because they're moving back towards the like, you know, and you, you see these things, for example, with coronavirus, like, well, you know, here's this guy in the US who thought that it was all a hoax and had a big coronavirus party and then he died and his friends died and this sort of thing, you know, that there are there's a whole literature people talk about this with narratives as well in extremism and people getting recruited for example terrorist organizations and there's a whole literature over there on what are called counter narratives so rather than just trying to talk people out of joining you know al-qaeda or something there's been a lot of work on trying to say like well what kind of story could you tell where like these guys are actually exploiting you and yeah you know your country's kind of bad it's got its problems but we're not like we're not like those guys and trying to put it more into that narrative form to try to lead people back uh, into, you know, closer to the accurate story. Yeah. Claire from Shell Harbour has said, Colin, do you think people being at home in lockdown and isolated with too much time on their hands contributed to the explosion of, I never know how to say it, QAnon and COVID-19? QAnon and COVID-19 misinformation? Yeah, I mean, look, certainly didn't help. <laughs> it's funny, like, you just look at, like, spikes in online social media and there are, yeah, like, people had a lot of time on their hands. They were spending a lot more time online, especially early on in the lockdowns. Um, I do think also, I mean, it's worth pointing out, uh, and there's a nice book on this, if anyone's interested, about the 2016 election called Network Propaganda. Uh, which I talk about a bit more in the longer version of this, that <clears throat> talks about, you know, we also have this problem that in the U.S. and U.S. media really dominates even in Australia, or, you know, drives the conversation in Australia a lot. I mean, you have right-wing news sources, particularly Fox News and Breitbart, pushing flat-out conspiracy theories. You had the President of the United States at least suggesting that he believed uh, the wackier versions of the QAnon conspiracy theory certainly weren't like damping it down. So I think there's a, it's easy to put some of this as like, oh yeah, online social media is bad. And there is a lot of stuff that spreads around on it. But unfortunately, traditional media bears a lot of the blame, I think, for some of the more severe problems that we've had in the past four or five years. And the network propaganda has a really nice, very in-depth look at the role conspiracy theorizing, particularly about Hillary Clinton played, uh, a pr conspiracy theorizing about Hillary Clinton played in making Trump seem more palatable to evangelical voters because Trump is not a particularly good like fundamentalist Christian, but if you think that the, the option is like literally a Satan worshiping, I don't know, assassin, uh, who also, you know, is also a Muslim, what, whatever, uh, then it, Trump at least became more palatable. So, you know, I think that's worth keeping in mind. That said, people, you know, <laughs> people certainly had a lot more time to sit there and argue online and, you know, uh, just poke around and having, I think the other problem I always want to mention is, especially early on in the pandemic, there just wasn't that much accurate information because nobody knew what was going on. So mo even the even the true sources of information were all pretty uncertain. Uh, so there was really this kind of information vacuum that allowed a lot to flourish. QAnon is its own kind of weird collective storytelling thing. It taps into this worry about children, uh, although it's been quite problematic. I'm sorry, I keep seeing chat things come up and go away, but I think someone mentioned like QAnon's actually been really bad apparently for people who do care about sex trafficking. Uh, which is a legitimate problem, but now they're getting swamped with all of these false complaints. Uh, so, you know, that was tapping into a different set of things. But I think with coronavirus, yeah, I mean, there's just this long period of time where everyone was scared and there wasn't much you could tell them. And so mm. bad sources of information really flourished. Yeah, definitely. I remember when we went into lockdown in Australia, Italy was in the thick of it. So it was terrifying. Yeah, yeah. You know? It was terrifying. Everybody was thinking that was how it was going to be for us. It was... I remember yeah. that. It was really awful. Will's asked, I know you have to get going soon, Colin. I don't want to hold you yeah, up. Yeah, I managed to longer. push something back a bit. So I've got a few more. Oh, okay. So it's fine. Great. Um, thank you. Will from Shell Harbour Library has asked, is steering people back to the truth our role in libraries or is it helping find information that meets their need? For example, would it be appropriate to refuse information requests for information that supports conspiracy theories? Interesting. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> I, I, 
<laughs> oh, that's actually a really good question. Um, probably one that I, of all the people on this conversation, I'm like least qualified to answer because you guys have a much better sense about what you should be doing. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, right? Because, you know, I think one distinction you might make that I think would be, you know, potentially worth it is there's probably a difference between the kind of present problematic uh, thing. So coronavirus conspiracies or QAnon or what, you know, whatever's going on now, or, you know, if it's a bushfire and people are there, there were a heap of bushfire conspiracy theories. Those ones, I feel like your ethical duty is probably more towards getting people towards the right information. Uh, if someone, you know, if someone wants to go like, and they're like, look, I'm really into flat earth and I want you to like, you know, show me everything you have about different models of how the earth is shaped. I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting, that there I sort of feel like maybe what, what you want to do is sort of more encourage them to the, the kind of scholarly instinct of finding sources of information and evaluating them for accuracy, like, um, because there, that's one of the things where I think there's enough settled science that it's probably going to stand on their own. So, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting problem. I will say one of the problems that you find, and certainly this must be one that you guys would face as well, is you know, there's a very heavy handed sort of response people sometimes have, which say like, well, Twitter should just ban conspiracy theories, problem solved. Uh, the problem is if, you know, if people do that, or if the library is like, look, we're not gonna like give you these books, then people will just not go to the library, they'll find it somewhere else. Uh, and there's, where they go is probably gonna be worse than where you guys are. So there's a really fine line between, you know, trying to steer people away from stuff that's wrong uh, and stuff that, uh, and just pushing them away entirely. That said, I mean, if someone's like, I do take it like there are clear cases where if someone comes to the library, like, look, I got a neighbor, I hate him. I need to know how to build a pipe bomb. Where's your chemistry section? Everyone agrees that the librarians should probably, I, I don't know what you guys do. Maybe call the cops, certainly steer them away from the chemistry section uh, and maybe towards the like self-help section instead. So, you know, some of the more extreme ones you you can think of on that model, but otherwise, you know, for many of these sort of the historically based ones, I feel like it's more a matter of you know, trying to steer them towards accurate information, but also helping them make their own judgments about it. That's off the top of my head. It's an interesting problem. Mm. It's really interesting. I think I think I've got all the questions. Have I missed? If I, I hope I haven't missed anybody. If we have, maybe maybe they can. We can drop you an email just to catch yeah, any other an questions. Email. Is that okay, um, Colin? Yeah, that's fine. That's great. I mean, feel free to follow up on anything, and if you've got any particular thoughts that are prompted by this as well like mm -hmm. I, I i'm thinking a lot about you know some of this stuff for public audiences and how you know people who interact with the public might deal with it so any thoughts or any any suggestions you have would be fantastic thank you we'll wrap it up let you go right. um well thanks again thank kelly and thanks everyone for coming out it was um yeah appreciate it and good and thanks for the uh thanks for the questions no worries. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so now we're going to hear from Michael Adams at the State Library. Michael is Librarian Specialist Information Services, and he's going to give us some information about the new online drug info training. Thanks for joining us, Michael. I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm part of the drug info team here at the library. Uh, for anyone who isn't aware what the drug info team do, uh, drug info is a partnership between the State Library and New South Wales Health, which is run through public libraries. And the aim is to make quality information about drugs uh, and alcohol available to the public. So our role in the Drug Info team is to provide public library staff with access to the training and resources they need to uh, effectively run a drug and alcohol information service at public libraries. So this is done through resources, uh, particularly the Drug Info website and the Drug Info collection. So that's a physical collection of books and pamphlets available in public libraries. 
We also provide a range of promotional resources. So some of you may have had the drug and alcohol info hub at your libraries. We have some other promotional resources available and we also provide face-to-face -face training. We'll go around the state and provide training in drug info as well as find legal answers. So the training portal we've devised, this was um, all, this all came together during lockdown last year. So it was a time where face-to-face -face training wasn't possible. But of course, now we are getting back into libraries, which has been really good. We've had our first face-to-face -face training for the year in the last couple of weeks, and, and we have more on the way. So now that we are back giving live training, it was really important that the online portal didn't just replicate what we provide in our training sessions, didn't just replicate information already available on the Drug Info website. Uh, we also work closely with New South Wales Health, as I said, they have a website called Your Room, which also provides drug and alcohol information. So it was really important with this training portal that it you know, occupies a different space in the landscape and isn't just doing stuff that is available elsewhere. So I'm gonna just share my screen now to give you a, a glimpse at the training portal. And okay, so this is the Drug Info website, which uh, some of you may be familiar with, but the portal itself um, is available here. I'm just gonna go back to the homepage. So the aims of this training is just to make that information available online more accessible. So to provide public library staff with the training to know where to go for information. So there's a, a couple of main elements of the training. Firstly, it is what is Drug Info? So for anyone new to Drug Info, in this introduction service, we've provided a bit of a, a breakdown as to the aims of Drug Info and what they can expect from the online training portal. The biggest element of the training is in this second section, Drug Info at your library. So this training is really aimed at making public library staff more confident in accessing information that's either available online through the Drug Info website or available at their libraries through the Drug Info collection. So part of that is making sure that the collection is up to date. And if it's not, where to go to get it up to date. Using the Drug Info website, the different elements of it to uh, help library users to, to access that information. And then also information specific to public library staff. So where to go to promote your drug info service to make it a more effective service. So it was I'm just opening this up. So what we've done is to make that information available through a series of links and information. We've created some videos to help with the training as well as a, a number of different exercises. The exercises are aimed not at making people know everything about drugs and alcohol. It's about making public library staff aware of where to go to find that information. And in this case, it's to make them aware of where to go on the public library services website to get those promotional resources that I'm talking about. The other thing we've done with the portal is to have these what we've called show bag items. So people doing the portal as they go along can add these items to their show bag and at the end uh, collect them. So that includes resources that we'd, that we'd al already developed. So logos and other assorted promotional material. We've created this digital calendar that basically tells you throughout the year when some appropriate times to promote drug info are. So the obvious ones, Seniors Week and Youth Week, as well as Law Week, these are big endeavours that we have already been promoting in the course of our work in, in drug info. But also, you know, like October Mental Health Month, whatever it might be, there's 
what we've said in the portal is there's never a bad time to promote drug info. So this resource is just designed to keep it in the front of uh, library staff's minds that they could actually, you know, be talking about drug info and directing their customers at any time in the year. So the portal, it goes for about one hour. We've tried to keep it quite condensed. As I said, we've tried to make it interactive with a range of videos and those show bag elements. It's not too text heavy. As I said, we're not aiming to tell everyone about drug and alcohol information. We're aiming to make sure they know where to go. So this last module is just a little refresher that goes through the different elements of drug info. So a section on alcohol that links to some of the resources that we'd already developed on our website and some links on how to get there and some exercises directing them on where to go for that information. So I'm just gonna stop sharing briefly. So that is the portal. Uh, it's been live for a couple of months now. We've had really good take up. It's been really encouraging how many uh, public library staff are getting involved. I think we've had one library has already had 24 people complete the training. So the training is available you know, at any time. You don't have to sit down and do it all in one hour. You can create an account when you have a few minutes, you know, go in and you know, do some of it and then come back to it at a later date. So it is available to all public library staff now. We have been promoting it through our face-to-face -face training, as well as to libraries who are receiving the hub. So just to once again, show you how to access that training. So from the public library services page, if you go into professional development and events, and go in to the professional development course information. So if we go down there, you'll see there, there's a box for drug info online training. So if you open this up, you can get the instructions to create an account, uh, go in and co complete the training. We also have right next to it, information on how to access that face-to-face -face training. So as I said, we are back in business, going out to different libraries, and we'd love to come to your library. So if that is something that you're interested in, um, please, again, go to the professional development section of the Public Library Services website. Uh, you can go in here, learn a bit more about the training. And uh, if we go down here, to contact the public library services and we can arrange a time to come out to you. Uh, and yeah, in the meantime, we'd, we'd really love it if you you went in and, and had a look at the training and please, we've got a feedback form there. So any way we can improve, improve it, this is something new to us. So um, yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So yeah, thank you for that. Thanks, Michael. It's really, it's, it's great. Thank you so much. I haven't got any questions in the chat that I can see yet. Um, okay, if uh, anyone does have any questions or, or wants to know more, my contact details on the website. So just get in touch. Great, thanks so much. Oh, here we go. There is a question from Emma at Northern Beaches. Um, does it include the new vaping for very young people yeah again so it doesn't in the portal because that information is available on the drug info website so we do have information like that um, but the aim of the portal is to get people onto the website and any other resource that might come in handy for that great did you say that there was a library that all the staff had done the training Together? I don't know if it's all, but it's but it's 24. 24? So, yep. Yeah, so that was really encouraging. So. Do you know if um, they're doing that as a like together as a group or just individually? I think it would be individually, but I think yep. there, there would have been someone there really, you know, pushing the barrel. So that was really yep. nice to see. Yeah, it's excellent. 
Cool, just see if anybody else has any more questions. Can't see any, but they can contact you anyway yep. if we okay. have any others. All right, Great. okay, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming. Right. See ya. <laughs> see ya. That brings us to the end. Michelle and Ellen, did you want to step in? I'm just going to answer one of the questions from chat. The presentations where I have copies of them will go on the wiki. The video provided everything works will go on the video on the wiki too. So it may be that you you get the presentations through the um, video rather than the slides. If I don't have a set of the slides. I think I've got two of the four. Um, yep, yeah, sorry, two of the three. So um, for Colin's one, you will need to um, go through the video to get those. Uh, they'll be up in the next probably the next day because it usually takes a while for the video to kind of go unprocessed enough to be uploaded. Can always ask Colin for a copy of his too, so I'm sure he wouldn't mind. With that? Hmm? Would you be able to follow up with that? Yeah, yeah, I'll send him an email. Yeah, no trouble. Emailing out an evaluation, Alan, or are you going to? Oh, sorry, it? yes, I'm not being very efficient. It should go out at about three o'clock this afternoon. Um, it may not have all the late registration, so if you miss it, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, although I will update it after this. And please fill that in because it does help with future planning. Um, and there'll probably be an online talk later this year from an organisation that we weren't able to coordinate, they couldn't make today. Um, and that will be um, one to watch for as well. That will be announced through the reference um, and PLN email lists. Wonderful. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. So if people can fill in the evaluation. It really does help for future planning. That is saying, planning that there may be a future rather than, yeah. <laughs> oh, let's not go down that conspiracy rabbit hole, Ellen. <laughs> oh, look, I actually thought that was very helpful. <laughs> it was, it was great. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers today um, to have presented. Also, I'd like to thank everyone who attended today. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone got something from today, um, this morning. We kept it nice and short so that as many people could attend as possible around, obviously you will have other duties as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email anyone um, from the group if you have their email addresses or email Ellen and she'll forward on the emails to us. Um, we're always looking for new members. So um, to join the reference, um, group. So if you're interested, please contact Ellen and let her know. Um, more hands to make light work. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And um, hopefully we'll see you at future reference sessions. Thank you. Bye.